Hello everyone, and welcome back to a new video in Introduction to the Finite Element Method, in which we are going to be talking about the quadratic elements. Now please notice that this video is part of a video series that we'll be linking on the top right, which is basically moving through the book The First Course in the Finite Element Method by Dario L. Logan. In today's video, we are only going to take a quick view on the quadratic element with good reasons because of the mathematical heavy nature of that element. Um, so with that being said, sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Okay, so we are starting with the quadratic element. Notice that you have node number one, node number two, three, and four and if you remember my triangular series the cst element which i'll be linking on the top right again i talked about the importance of counterclockwise or clockwise numbering those numbers are not haphazardly those are actually either counterclockwise or clockwise to facilitate the local x and y of each of those quads now i will quickly go through the book what the book is talking about here and then i will give my own impressions of it and why uh, this might be a little bit iffy if you want to implement this element in real life. So let's derive the quad element equations. A quad has four points, as you can see, and each point has two possible movements. A point could move in the x-axis, u1, u2, u3, and u4, and a point could move in the y-axis, v1, v2, v3, and v4, which means in the displacement functions, we need to assume certain displacement fields that is solvable. Now, in the previous CST element, we only chose up until this domain. In our CST elements, I had a1, a2x, a3y, a4, a5x, and a7y. Now, because I have two extra degrees of freedom, I would need two extra terms, which come in a new a4 and a new a8 a a in xy. Now, why did we choose xy? Like you could choose x square, y square, y xy. We will be talking about this in the future. Basically, there is a triangle that explains, there is a long story behind this, and I don't want to spoil it right now, but the idea is that there is a certain hierarchy of assuming your displacement functions based on the available degrees of freedom. So I'll be talking about this later when I talk about, when I talk about the isoparametric elements. For now, you don't know this, so let's just say that we are assuming those displacement functions because they kind of look cool, although I tell you there is a reason for that, but you don't know this yet. And we have four unknowns. So since we have four unknowns, we need four knowns to calculate our unknowns. Now with a keen eye, you could start foreshadowing the problems with this displacement function and the problems with this element and the approach that the book is taking in general. What I'm trying to say is, this is no longer a constant strain element, meaning if you derive with respect to x, you still have a y component, which is an unknown, a variable. And if you derive with respect to y, you still get an x component. So the derivatives now are no longer constant numbers. The derivatives now are functions. And this will be a complicated thing in the very near future. So, okay. We have eight degrees of freedom, basically, so we can find our eight A values, A1, A2, A3, and so on. Now I'm showing you four of them because you could do the same thing for V. U at negative B and negative H, why negative B and negative H? Because this is zero, zero, and this is a right angle rectangle. Notice how many conditions are here. I will talk about this at the end of the video. But the equations derived in this lecture are based on a right angle rectangle. Like if it's a parallelogram, you can't do it. If it's a trapezoid, you can't do it. So u at negative b, negative h, because this point, point number one, is at x equals negative b, and at y equals negative h, you can see the b here and the h here, where b is half the width and h is half the height which might be strange because you are used to saying B and H for the width and height, but now those are half the width and half the height. So basically the U at this corner is U1, 
the u at the other corner is u2, u3, and u4. So you can calculate a1, a2, a3, and a4 based on u1, u2, u3, and u4. How do you do this? You should remember the triangle. Those are four equations with four unknowns. You can solve them with mathematical tools. Now, please notice that unlike the triangle, those coordinates are based on a rectangle. So it's kind of not easy. Now, it should to be said, I want to say that you could extend this with some modifications to deal with parallelograms. But of course, imagine um, the points here. You would have a big headache to deal with those points. What I'm trying to say is, look, imagine if I have a parallelogram, another yet simple element. And this is the center of the parallelogram, and I'm using this as my x and y. How could I find those? Well, your b would be half of this and your h would be half of this. But this corner now, this corner coordinate is no longer b and h. No, this corner coordinate is actually b plus whatever this distance is. This immediately ramps up in difficulty because suddenly the angle that you have here, the theta you have here, is gonna affect the coordinates of the four corners. One of them is gonna be b plus I think h10 or something. I have no idea, I have to calculate this. So what I'm trying to say is it ramps up in difficulty immediately, so those elements are taken based on this assumption. If you have another element, you have to rewrite the entire equations, which yields to rewriting the entire shape functions. Because how can you find the shape function? You see, u equals the shape function multiplied by u of the nodes. If you find your a1, a2, and a3, and a4, those are going to be functions in b and h because of this assumption. You can rearrange them to get the shape functions n1, n2, n3, and so forth. This is a mathematical nightmare, and this is only valid for a rectangle. If you have a parallelogram, you might have tan thetas and whatnot inside this. So it gets really difficult very fast. Now, okay, I have my shape functions. And that's why I told you this video is kind of a theoretical rundown. I don't even want to solve an example. The book does it, but in a rather strange way. I will come to that soon. So what I'm trying to say is that now you have your deflections, u and v, as a function in the movements of the nodes. Shape function 1 multiplied by u1. Shape function 2 multiplied by u2. Shape function 3 multiplied by u3. And shape function 4, this is for u. For v, of course, you have shape functions multiplied by v's. The rest will follow the same steps of the triangle. Remember what we have to do. We have to find sigma because it's related to forces. And the sigma is going to be d based on your material matrix multiplied by b. b is the derivative of the shape functions, if you remember. It was the partial derivative of shape function to partial derivative x multiplied by d. Why this? Because b multiplied by d, check out the previous video, which I will link up right, because b multiplied by d is your strain. So strain multiplied by elastic modulus gives you the stress. Now, of course, here you have strain in u, strain in v, and also the shear strain, which is the cross strain between those two things. Now, the book does something strange. It finds this epsilon based on the u, which is a1 plus a2x, plus a3y, plus a4xy, and when you derive this, this gets eliminated, x gets eliminated, this gets eliminated, x gets eliminated, so you get a2 plus a4y, which you see here. Similarly for y, similarly for gamma. Now this is absolutely not useful. It doesn't help you because you don't know what the a's are. You want to use the shape functions instead. So this is a waste of time, but the book does explain this to you. Now, if you want to use the shape functions, by the magic of mathematics, this is the derivative of shape functions. Allow me to show you one, exa one example here. Let's show you this. What is this? This is the partial derivative of the shape function with respect to x, and then partial derivative of the shape function with respect to y. So what's the partial derivative of shape function 1 with respect to x? If you partialize shape function 1 with respect to x, then all you get here is negative 1 based on this, and your answer is negative 1 h minus y over bh. Let's take a look if that's the case. Yep, indeed, it's negative 1 
h minus y over 4bh. However, 4bh is taken outside. And finally, here you have the partial derivative of shape function 1 with respect to y. So let's take a look on that. Yet again, this is shape function 1. The partial derivative to respect to y is negative 1 in this case, because those are constants. So it's negative b minus x over 4bh. If you go here, you say negative b over x over 4bh. Indeed, that's true. So at least we know how this goes. Now, here is the thing, the crux of the problem. This b in the constant strain triangle was a matrix of numbers. You had four, five, six, and so on. This here is a matrix of equations because you have an unknown in y and an unknown in x. This is a big problem. And if you're wondering why is this a big problem, it's a big problem because you are going to double integrate and you are going to integrate with regard to x and regard to y. This is a mathematical nightmare because you would have to, and that's why the book actually runs away here, you would have to evaluate this, which is b transpose multiplied by d multiplied by b. Now notice d is a matrix of numbers. Thickness is a number. However, this is a matrix of equations, and this is a matrix of equations, meaning you would have to multiply this huge equation with another huge equation, which will give you squares and whatnot, and then not only this, you would have to double integrate it once for x and once for y. This is a mathematical nightmare. So this becomes almost an inhumane task to do by hand. Now, of course, here the book actually tells you, hey, the double integral has been done by MathCAD, and here is your stiffness matrix, which is kind of funny that it shows here is the integration done and by. Now, here are some questions I want to ask. A hypothetical viewer would say, well, there is no way I can deal with rectangles because it's too complicated. Well, no, you can deal with rectangles because your computer can integrate that for you. Now, hypothetical viewer number two could say, okay, but I heard you saying that all this big derivation works only for this because your shape functions were based on the shape of the element. This b minus x, h minus y, whatever, this was based on the shape of the element. I mean, if the element was a square, the equations would be different. I mean, yes, you still could use b and h. And if this was inclined like this, your equations would be different. And worst of all, if this was a trapezoid, then good luck evaluating that because suddenly you have b1 and h, b2 and h. Worst of them all, if this is a general quad, just a general quad, nothing is parallel, nothing is equal. You would have h1 and h2 and b1 and b2. So you would think this is a hopeless case. And you know what? Yes, it is. This way of dealing with stiffness matrix is not feasible for scaling up in a computer software. Suddenly, from now on, we have stiffness matrices that depend on the shape of the element. And this is a huge weakness in the way or the approach we are dealing with our elements at the moment. You see, that's the reason why the scientists have come up with something called isoparametric formulation. You don't know this yet, but what we will be learning very soon in the isoparametric formulation is that you, if you see an element like this, we actually project the element into a standard element of minus one, one, and so on, of one or something. This is a standard element. We project our element into the standard element and use a standard element to calculate the stiffness matrix and project it back to our original element. This is what we will be doing in the future because this isoparametric formulation allows you to calculate the stiffness matrix of any element, no matter what the shape is. Now, of course, the worse the shape, the less accurate it is. Like if you have a non-convex, whatever this strange shape is, then of course the approximation is gonna be large and the error is big. But for a regularly meshed mesh, like a mesh that is made out of somewhat regular elements, somewhat like this, for example, 
you would argue that the error is not that large. The error gets bigger the more your element deviates from the standard element. And that's why you can see in some softwares that they use finer meshes because finer meshes produce somewhat closer to standard elements. This is all gonna be talk of the future. What I want to finish my video with is that the book basically runs away here and tells you here are some cool things to read and starts talking about like a small intermission in chapter seven, which is talking about practical considerations and tries to like take your attention off this weakness and tells you, hey, look at this cool CST versus quad comparison. But of course, we don't forget that. We say that this entire quad element is weak. It's not scalable. You cannot program it because your shape functions depend primarily on the shape of an element, which would be a nightmare for computer applications. So I want to finish my video here saying that, hey, you learned how the quad elements work. But however, you also learned how or what this, the weaknesses of this quad element is. So with that being said, and before I finish, I want to give a huge quadrilateral sized shout out to our dear channel members in the contributor level and the helper level whose names are going to be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as the support to the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with videos on time, hopefully, and with a certain quality I try to achieve. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed the video and that it was beneficial for you. Of course, if you have enjoyed the video, then please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, and providing sacrifices to the YouTube algorithm. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel, and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.